Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this ongoing study on rest. So important that uh, we remember that there is a specific invitation by Jesus to come to Him and rest. And in fact, if you don't find that rest, we are not really in Jesus. So help us to understand the barriers to this rest that we will need to surmount so that we indeed can enter into the trust. Again, we ask that you make us humble and teachable. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So our study for uh, the next lesson is uh, longing for more. This, this is a dissatisfaction or discontent that is innate in men. Uh, that is the cause for restlessness. So before we do that, let me just uh, review what we covered uh, last week because uh, I kind of skimmed through the Saturday or the seventh day uh, observance of the Sabbath. Let me just review this. I kind of uh, put together a composite of all the slides that we covered before to summarize exactly what the angle of the seventh day observance is. Okay, remember my good friend who already passed, but he was in our church for several weekends. Uh, I even had the honor of having potluck with him. I, was, I had Sabbath dinner with him in church after he did the presentation. Dr. Samueli Bakilki, who was the first non-Catholic to be admitted to the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, completing a doctoral degree. And, uh, uh, Universidad uh, Gregoriana Pontifica in Rome where they train all the popes. You need to go to that university before you can even be eligible to be a pope. And of course, the dissertation of Dr. Bakyoki, as you already know, was entitled A Historical Investigation of the Rise of Sunday, Observance in Early Christianity. And you remember there were three dissertations before he embarked into his own dissertation. He was even discouraged by dissertation panel to say, hey, three priests attempted to, to write a dissertation on the subject, uh, and they did not make it. They failed. So you, would you like to reconsider your subject? And Dr. Bakayoki said, no, I will deal with the same subject, except for I will come up with a different conclusion. And so it was when he wrote the dissertation, uh, he found in the archives of the Vatican while he was doing his research a document, uh, um, a very early document that says uh, Epiphanius, a 4th century Palestinian historian, relates the acts of the direct descendants of the Jerusalem church after the destruction of the city, that they persisted in the observance of the Sabbath until his own time in 350 AD. Okay, here's the whole issue about the research. There is a claim that Sunday observance happened because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it was introduced by the early church in Jerusalem. So the origin of Sunday observance came from the early church. It came from the New Testament. Because the research of Dr. Bakyoki proved that there was no change in the seventh day observance of the Sabbath in the New Testament. Uh, that was done by the apostles or the early church. Instead, there is historical documentation that the early church, the descendants of the Jerusalem church, persisted in keeping the Sabbath all the way to 350 AD. Yeah, that's, that's over 300 years from Jesus' ascension. And if they persisted in observing the Sabbath, then there was no change of the Sabbath uh, sanctioned by the Bible or sanctioned by the New Testament. Again, was there a change? Yes, there was a change. There was a decree of the church, uh, the Lord is saying decree, to change the observance of the solemnity of the Sabbath from the seventh day to the first day. Uh, and the major professor of uh, Dr. Bakilki was Vincenzo Monachino said, the Epiphanius narrative is the death knell to the theory that makes Jerusalem the birthplace of Sunday keeping. So this was very conclusive, uh, very convincing that no less than Pope Paul VI awarded Samuel Bakyoke a gold medal for earning the academic distinction of summa cum laude. And for a while, the Vatican Press actually published his book. 
And of course, it, it had raving reviews, and one of the reviewers is a very respected evangelical theologian today. His name is Don Carson, a uh, biblical research professor in Trinity Evangelical Seminary here in Illinois. Um, he says in his review, is, if this contention of Dr. Bakyoki is, is correct, and I think it is, then either one must go all the way with him and support a continuing seven-day Sabbath, or one must develop some other synthesis. I am personally inclined toward the latter. Okay. How convincing was this? I remember Dr. Bakyoki handing me a very thick uh, compilation of letters that was sent to him, correspondence with several churches. In one of the churches, uh, a Baptist church in Lucerne Valley, who had the series on the studies of Dr. Bakyoki in the Sabbath, they actually moved their church services to the seventh day or Saturday after looking at the research of Dr. Bakyoki. Meanwhile, Don Carson, who finds it very, very convincing, uh, decided to write his own book. Uh, actually, he didn't write it. He edited the book. It is a compendium of scholarly articles from Cambridge professors and theologians entitled From Sabbath to Lord's Day. Um, the lay counterpart of that, as we studied before, was written by Dale Ratzclaff, a former Seventh-day Adventist uh, pastor who wrote Sabbath in Crisis. And uh, well, when you read Sabbath in Crisis, I think uh, our university, uh, Anderson University professors tactfully just say that uh, this, the, the need for scholarly and academic credentials for the book is there because you know what happened, right? There, there were no footnotes, and uh, the documentation was very scarce. But it's amazing that the one who wrote the foreword for the book was Don Carson. Uh, and, and of course, we, we talked about this. The way around the conclusion of Don Carson in his review of Dr. Bakilgo's book was, hey, you know, fine, it is very convincing uh, for me to follow Dr. Bakilgo's logic from the scriptures. And if I were to keep the Sabbath, it's got to be the seventh day. So what he did was we pulled the rug from under the whole thing, and he subscribed to New Covenant theology. And the New Covenant theology, of course, teaches that the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments is no longer binding because they were the words of the Old Covenant. The New Covenant, we have a new law, and we, we spent a Sabbath about that. But all I'm saying is Dr. Carson, in order to circumvent uh, the convincing evidence that Dr. Bagyoki presented in his research and his dissertation had to resort to New Covenant theology. Now, like, we have to understand this, and we cover this also in the New Covenants. Uh, Dr. Marcus Torres, probably one of the better uh, treatments of the Covenants, especially from an Adventist perspective, to relate it to the, to the perspective of the evangelical community or the Protestant uh, community, gives us this grid. Basically, there's category A and category B today when it comes to the Decalogue. In Covenantalism, we got the Westminster Confession and the Second Law Baptist Confession. Okay, remember, this people, most evangelicals and Protestants who subscribe to the Westminster Confession and Second Law and Baptist Confession embrace the perpetuity of the law and the Sabbath, which means they still recognize the validity of the Ten Commandments. Okay? The only difference between the two is you got infant baptism for the Westminster Confession, and then you got credo baptism, the baptism of the believers, second London baptism. So a great many of Protestants today believe in the Ten Commandments. And because they do, then they believe in the Sabbath. So stop following the research of Dr. McKeown. And those who belong to this camp basically will have to accept the seven-day Sabbath as the Sabbath stated in the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. Meanwhile, on the other side, we got dispensationalists. Remember that the hype on the secret rapture because of the Left Behind series, uh, the dispensationalists because it, 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 it divides, divides the Bible into seven dispensations, of course, gets rid of the dispensation of the law and the Ten Commandments no longer valid. Alongside this, a newer concept is the New Covenant Theology, which we already uh, discussed. It rejects the perpetuity of the law and the Sabbath. So unless you belong to category B, you should still accept the perpetuity of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and the Seventh-day Sabbath. And like we said, 
as convinced as Dr. Don Carson was in the writing and the research of Dr. Bakyoki, he decided to do the New Covenant Theology to circumvent following the seventh day of servants of the Sabbath. He basically said, take it, take the rug from under it. The Decalogue is no longer valid, so I don't have to keep the Sabbath. Okay, so I thought that would be very helpful for us to process the, in, in a more comprehensive way the Sabbath lessons that we've covered for the last two Sabbaths now, and these the third Sabbath, we'll probably cover the Sabbath again. Remember the New Covenant, I'll just put this very quickly, we already discussed this before, for this the new co the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, will, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. They miss it, it's very obvious in the New Covenant, written in Jeremiah, uh, they've repeated in Hebrews, there is no change of law. There is a change of the placement of the law. In the Old Covenant, the law was written in two tablets of stones. Okay? But in the New Covenant, it will be written in the hearts and put in the minds of men. So unless you look at the Bible the way it states it, you cannot say that the Decalogue is now invalid. It's no longer relevant because even in the New Covenant, the Decalogue or the commandments are still there except for it's no longer followed based on the letter of the law but based on the spirit written in the heart. So we go to our lesson now from, as a springboard. Of course, Hebrews 4 is used by most of those who study the Sabbath to look at the, the meaning of the Sabbath. And in fact, you, the, the three points that we covered last week is found in Hebrews 4. But let me uh, approach it from a different tack because our, our, our tact is about discontent, the longing for more. And let me just go through what Re Hebrews 4, 1 to 11 is about because that's, that's the passage that the authors of the quarterly use. And it's kind of difficult. I was trying to follow their line of thought. Uh, as I, find, I found it difficult to find some coherence in all the, the points that they were trying to discuss. But because they were quoting Hebrews 4, I said, why don't I just go to Hebrews 4 in our study and process Hebrews 4 so we can understand the lesson as we pre previate today. So the concept of entering God's rest appears six times in Hebrews 4, 1 to 11. So it was twice in verse 6. Okay, these are the, the times, that uh, the occurrences in, in that passage. Therefore, let us fear if while the promise remains of entering his rest, that's... Um, Verse 1 and verse 6, And therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter, in verse 10, the one who has entered distressed as himself also rested from his works as God did from his. And in 11, Therefore, let us be diligent to enter the dress so that no one will fall through following the same example of obedience. So, really, Hebrews 4, 1 to 11 is about entering the rest. It's very clear it's re that that phrase is repeated so many times in the passage. And when that phrase is repeated so many times in the passage, it's already a signal for us to say this is really the thrust of that certain portion of Scripture. And the word rest itself is used 10 times in Hebrews 4, 1 to 11. At times, the word describes spiritual salvation. By believing, we enter into the rest that God gives. Sometimes the word refers to Israel entering the promised land, you know, where Joshua takes the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. At other times, it refers to God's rest on the seventh day after creation. So three angles, three thrusts in terms of the Sabbath rest that is being taught in Hebrews 4, 1 to 11. When addressing those in the church, it is reference to our salvation. Of course, people in the church, whether you're a Jew or non-Jew or Gentile, there's no difference anymore. You believe in Jesus Christ. You have Abraham's seed. It's a matter of your faith, and that faith and belief takes you into salvation. But when talking about the Israelites, it refers to the peace they will experience in the promised land. Okay, Because it uses an illustration by the author to the book of Hebrews in terms of the rest that's promised by God. When talking about God, it is reference to the rest on the seventh day. So though Joshua gave them some rest, he didn't give them permanent rest. That's what he's saying. You know, you, you see there was a rest when they entered Canaan's land. There was also a rest uh, in creation. But uh, the writer said, hey, Joshua gave them rest when they went to the promise. 
But it was not a permanent rest because 400 years later, David is still t talking about the rest that's available to us in Psalm 95. And then several hundred years after that, Isaiah speaks about a future rest in Isaiah 14.3. So this rest is not limited to the children of Israel or the Jews going into the promised land. This rest is more comprehensive, and as we started last week, it actually spans the Garden of Eden, the creation, all the way to the recreation when we have the new heavens and the new earth. The book of Hebrews is also about how great it's about how great Jesus is. The magnificence of Jesus is greater than the angels, greater than the priests, all the sanctuary system. Despite this, uh, this consistent thread in Hebrews about the supremacy, preeminence of Jesus Christ, there are five times in the book the author stops to exhort his readers to press on in faith, which are often called warning sections. There are five warning sections in Hebrews. Uh, uh, actually says scattered all over the book uh, while the book is trying to establish the preeminence and the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And out of the five warning section, Hebrews 4, 1 to 11 comes out. And that's our study for our lesson. God's promise of entering His rest still stands, so we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. I like the New, Le New Living Translation paraphrase of the text because it, it lends emphasis to the importance of this warning. He's saying we need to enter God's rest. We need to, there's a need in order for us to be safe, in order for us to be secure in God, we must enter His rest. And that invitation still stands. But we must tremble with fear. Some of the translations water this down. But we must tremble with fear. We must be afraid that we might fail to experience it. So the thrust of our lesson is basically, hey, it's possible for you not to enter into the trust. So why don't, don't you fearfully approach the subject and come to Jesus and find the trust? And I think that's where the title of the lesson comes into play. And let me introduce it with uh, uh, a, a song written by Foster the People. It is in an American indie pop uh, band I was formed in Los Angeles, but they had a, an album entitled Supermodel. But in, in, one, in, in one of the songs in the album, there's a song entitled Ask Yourself. And you say the dreamers always get what they desire. Well, I've found the more I want, the less I've got. Is this the life you've been waiting for? Or are you hoping that you'll be where you want with a little more? So th this is the cry of the human heart. You try to accumulate as much as you want, you know, this materialism and consumerism that has been eating us up as a society and as a culture. There's only one problem. The more I want, the less I've got. You keep on asking and asking for more, but you're never, never satisfied. Like, and like the song goes, I can get no satisfaction. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 6 and 8, but godliness with contentment is great gain. But we have food and clothing with this, we will be content. How do you find rest? You might have godliness and contentment. That's what the Bible says. But the reality is, while we're studying our lesson, the human heart is built in with, with our totally depraved hearts, built in to long for more. And that's, again, what Blaise Pascal calls the God-sized vacuum, because that emptiness will be there and you keep on accumulating things to fill that emptiness it will never be fulfilled until God himself fulfills that so I tried to divide the lesson into three parts and I, I look at them a three three pitfalls of discontentment why because if you're discontented you will never find rest this is restlessness and if you look at the pitfalls of discontentment, maybe we will find a way out of this discontentment and really enter the rest that God invites us to go into. The first pitfall is materialism. Hebrews 4, uh, three, last part of 3 into 4, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So, it now goes back to creation. Rest is in terms of creation. You got to understand, we, had, we studied this last week. 
uh, when you rest in creation and appreciate God's handiwork and His finished work, you're telling God, God, you're God and not me. I am in control. I might delude myself during the week to thinking, I can really work and earn my living, but really without you, I cannot do it. And that's why we look at God as the source of everything in creation. And, and this is the reason why we have some discontent. We never rec recognize that truth that God is really the creator and he handles the universe, he handles our lives. Uh, Rockefeller was asked, uh, he's considered to be the richest man in history in America, how much money is enough money? For John D. Rockefeller, the answer was just a little bit more. Remember, at the peak of his wealth, Rockefeller had a net worth of about 1% of the entire U.S. economy. Compared to today's rich guys, Rockefeller makes Bill Gates and Warren Buffett look like paupers. I mean, as, as, as rich as these billionaires are, they cannot match the wealth of John D. Rockefeller. But when he was asked, how much money is enough? The answer was just a little bit more. It's, there's, it's not enough. You long for some more. And I think Richard Foster hit the money when he wrote this quote. He said, contemporary culture is plagued by the passion to possess. With this result that the lust for affluence has become psychotic. Christian simplicity brings sanity to our compulsive extravagance and peace to our frantic spirit. Did you see that? <clears throat> contemporary culture. Our last for affluence, our consumerism, it's not only a problem with our pockets, this becomes psychotic, it becomes a mental health issue. That's what he's trying to say. Why? Because <coughs> many people who achieve financial freedom at an early age still live in slavery to desire and with a chronic dissatisfaction. But what are we saying here? Well, you see all this advertisement, right? You watch TV, you go to social media. <coughs> Here's a way to retire. At an early age, you can retire by 40, mid 40s to 50. You don't have to wait till you go 60s to retire. Just follow this wealth direction, you know, the accumulation of wealth, then you can retire. But yes, there are people who are able to do that. They become they hit success in terms of business and economy. But by the time they get to this retirement, they still are not satisfied. Well, I think uh, Cyprian, uh, an early church father, has summarized what this is all about. Uh, Bishop MacArthur says their property held them in chains. They think of themselves as owners, whereas it is they rather who are owned. Enslaved as they are to their own property, they are not the masters of their money, but it's slaves. Really, uh, do you own things or do those things own you? That's the question that we ask. And Jesus warns, he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. The moment you look at life in terms of how much you have and how much you accumulate, you'll never be satisfied because life is not about possessions and the abundance of what you have. But those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation, into a snare into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction, says Paul in 1 Timothy 6. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Right? You, people are saying, yes, money is not the root of evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. But we got to be careful because money can be a very powerful temptation and then we lose our priorities. And by losing our priorities, money becomes our God. And we lose God in the process. Uh, it was a book written by um, James P Patterson and Peter Kim uh, entitled The Day America Told the Truth. In that book, in the survey that they conducted, they asked one question of so many people. What are you willing to do for $10 million? They say 25% will abandon their entire family, 25% abandon their church, and 23% will become prostitutes for a week, 16% will give up their citizenships, 16% will leave their spouses, 10% will withhold testimony and let the murderer go free, 7% will even kill a stranger, and 3% will put their children up for adoption. See what money can do to your head and to your mind? This really is some out of this are psychotic decisions. Some problems with your thinking, but because of money, 
it can pervert and twist your mind. It's not so far from where we are right now, 2008, when we had that global economic crisis. And there followed uh, a string of suicides of formerly wealthy individuals. They tried to deceive the real estate market. You know what happened to the economy, right? There was, there was a big crisis because of the Ponzi scheme, Freddie Mac, and uh, all those real estate uh, giants, Bernard, Bernie Madoff. Uh, tried to milk a lot of people into investing and aside from ruining the future of a lot of the businessmen even from Europe they themselves who were involved committed suicide and killed themselves it's how money can be so deadly how did we get here Paul Zor says we must shift America from a needs to a desires culture People must be trained to desire, to want new things, even before the old have been entirely consumed. We must shape a new mentality in America. Men's desires must overshadow his needs. If you look at the history of the U.S. economy from World War I and there was a depression, what happened was there was enough to, to subsist. The basic needs of life, shelter, clothing, you know, uh, food. That was enough, but the Industrial Revolution came. So there was a lot of supply, and the problem of the businessman who wants to make money was there's so much supply than what we need. So what do we, how do we get rid of the supply? Otherwise, they will be gone and they'll be wasted. You know what we need to do? We will make the culture in America desire things rather than need things. You know, I, I'll go for what I want rather than what I need. And that culture began what we call today consumerism. Uh, Victor Lebeau, a, a retail analyst, I think puts it better. He says, our enormously productive economy demands that we make consumption our way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek our spiritual satisfaction and our ego satisfaction in consumption. The measure of social status, of social acceptance, of prestige is now to be found in our consumptive patterns. Wow, this is very telling. Because what happened when the industrial, industrial revolution came, goods were manufactured at a very rapid uh, pace and it became readily available to everybody, not just the rich and the famous who were just ex enjoying this as luxuries. Now, because of all the factories that began now, this is available to me, especially with the technology that we have today. All of this is available and even a common man can feel that he's wealthy, the status is is met because of what he consumes and what he buys. There's a book entitled Land of Desire, written by William Leeds, and he says, the cardinal features of this culture where acquisition and consumption is the means of achieving happiness. Consuming will make you happy. The cult of the new, the democratization of desire, and money value as the predominant measure of all values in society. See, we cannot escape it. We are in a culture that has been programmed to want some more, to consume. And because you want to consume and you want some more, you will never be satisfied. You will always long for more. As a reminder of uh, Moses, written in Deuteronomy 8.18, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you power to get wealth. Moses is saying in his valedictory address in Deuteronomy, You enter the promised land, you will start eating you know, fruits and produce that you did not plant. So it will be a land flowing with milk and honey. And honey, while you're enjoying yourself, do not forget, Always remember that it is the Lord your God who gives you the power to get all these resources. And so, more, so often, we forget. Will Rogers is known for this quote. Too many people spend money that they don't have, money that they haven't earned yet. This is the credit card problems we have. To buy things they don't want to impress people that they don't like. <laughs> it's a humorous way to put it, but this is the mindset of consumerism today here in our world. John Mark Homer says, the opposite of simplicity is in complexity. It's superficiality. Simplicity is limiting our possessions, expenses, activities, and social obligations 
to a level where we are free to live joyfully in the kingdom with Jesus. You cannot be free to live joyfully if you think you still need to accumulate some more. But if you simplify your life and find satisfaction and contentment in godliness and in Jesus Christ, then you will know what it means to be happy. Robert Shaw in the American Association of Christian Counselors said, when we cease from pursuing our material goals for one day each week, we're saying, God, I trust you to provide for my needs seven days a week, even if I only work six of them. And it goes back to the cause of the Sabbath rest. Why? Because we think that we provide for ourselves or we work the six days. No. I, we, trust, we should trust God to provide for us all days. Okay? Seven days, including the six days that we work. Sabbath ceasing means to cease not only from work, but also from the need to accomplish and be productive, from the worry and tension that accompany our modern criterion of efficiency, from our efforts to be in control of our lives as if we were God, from our possessiveness and our enculturation, and finally from the humdrum and meaninglessness that result when life is pursued without the Lord at the center of it all. I can't say it any better, like Marva Dawn said it, what happens when the Lord is not center of it all? We get to be enslaved by the things that we accumulate and we possess. Remember what the Bible says? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You don't belong to yourself. Nothing that you have is really yours because you have been bought with a price. So beautifully stated by Alan White in Christ's Object Lessons, page 325, by pouring the whole treasure of heaven into this world, how much? The whole treasure of heaven in Jesus Christ, by giving us in Christ all heaven, God has purchased the will, the affections, the mind, the soul of every human being. We don't own anything, not even our souls, our will and our affections. It belong to Christ because God has given Christ to redeem us from our sins. No wonder Paul says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought law and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus puts it this way. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You cannot serve God and money. Uh, excellent illustration about this is Heidelin Diaz, the first gold medalist the history of the Philippines' participation in the Olympics. And when she stood on the podium, the platform, to be awarded a gold medal and her national anthem was being played, if you listen very closely to what he said, the first thing he said was, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, to date, there's over 50 million pesos available to her in award and reward money for her accomplishment and she was asked in an interview what would you do with the money that you now have and of course the first thing she said of course i'm going to give my tithes i'm going to give the portion first portion to the lord this is what we call the supremacy of god the priority of god finding rest in god not in what we accumulate takes us to the so famous story about this man, Tommy, who made a boat, uh, and then he brought the boat uh, at the edge of the river and started to let out the string tied to it. He was admiring the boat, and, and, and all of a sudden, the water with the strong current pulled the boat away. Bottom line is, he lost the boat. And several days later, Tom was walking home from school and passed by a toy store. And to his amazement, he finds his boat right there in the toy store and he goes to the manager and said that's my boat you know you got to give it to me no no you can do it Sonny you're gonna do it because somebody brought it in today and have to buy it so you if you want it you got to buy it and of course he, he got all the money he had so he can get the boat back and as the illustration says you are now twice mine first I made you now I bought you and God tells us, you are now twice mine. I made you, 
and I shall redeem you in Jesus Christ. So you are not your own because Jesus has bought you. So what's the, the take home in the first part of our lesson? Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have for he has said I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's amazing if you go to Hebrews 13 5 the, the very all familiar text that we always quote I will never leave you nor forsake you that is given in the context of the love of money. He's basically saying forget money because the promise is I will never leave you nor forsake you and we'll go back and we'll summarize our lesson towards the end. He's saying now my presence will be, will be with you and I'll give you rest the presence of God is rest. You want to find rest? Keep your love, your life away from the love of money. And remember the promise that God's presence will always be with you. So that's the first part. The first pitfall we need to uh, avoid. And we avoid the pitfall of materialism. We can enter God's rest. The second pitfall we need to avoid is the pitfall of legalism. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them. Because they were not united by faith with those who listen, for we who have believed enter the trust. Let's let's get into the the backstory of this in the Old Testament. In Exodus 24, 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. This was the meeting at the foot of Mount Sinai when God descended to talk to the children of Israel. And then Moses gave all the instructions in the words from the God. What did, what did the children of Israel say? All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Uh, it, it is so clear when we studied the covenants, it was the reason for the failure of the children of Israel in the old covenant. They thought they can do it. By following God, they thought they can please God and they can render themselves acceptable to God. But what happened? In Deuteronomy 9, 6, as Moses reflects, on the life and the history of his people. Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness. For you are a stubborn people. Yes, you promise, but you are a stubborn people. You tried to promise and try to be good, but you were never really good. In fact, they despise his statute and his covenant that he made with their fathers and the warnings that he gave them. They went after false idols and became false, and they followed the nations that were around them. So let's go and try to summarize the takeaway for this part of our study. Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it so nicely. I mean, the, these are great words. Only he who believes is obedient, and only he who is obedient believes. Christianity without the living Christ is inevitably Christianity without discipleship. And Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. Uh, what is... Dietrich Bonhoeffer saying, in order for you to obey, you must believe. And if you believe, you will obey. You, know, you cannot separate the two. And what's the, what the problem of the children of Israel was when they heard the words of God, they thought they can just obey in their own strength. And they separated and divorced that belief and that faith from faith. And because that obedience is without faith, it will not work. It becomes legalism. It's a way to save yourself through your own effort. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. We kind of covered this last week, but basically it's saying, Rest happens because work has been completed and finished. And because God completed the work of creation in Genesis, He celebrates and rests from His achievement and His accomplishment. In the same token, in the New Testament, Jesus cries out, It is finished on the cross. So the work of redemption has been finished by Jesus Christ. Since it's completed, we can now enter into this rest. What, what does it say? Because the Lord rested, like the Lord stopped from doing anything, after creation, we can also stop from doing something. What the author of the book of Hebrews is saying, stop trying to save yourself. Because if you try to save yourself, you cannot do it. It's impossible for you to be saved through your own efforts or through the law. So stop, because it's already finished. Celebrate the finished work of Jesus Christ in the gospel. And remember what happened. Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. 
from top to bottom, the earth shook and the rocks were split. Even the, the temple separating the holy place and the most holy place, remember in the sanctuary, was torn because now through Jesus Christ we are able to approach the throne of God boldly because the work of redemption has been finished. Let's review exactly what this means. We've covered this so many times, but it's worth looking at this in terms of our lesson for this coming Sabbath. Remember when we first uh, were created, this, when God created Adam and Eve, there was a probationary period that was given to them because they were not created immortal. There was this what we call conditional immortality. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay? If you don't, you will have eternal life and completion when you complete that probationary period. But the moment you violate at any given point in time before the completion, you will surely die. What happened? Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all. It was, only not, it was not only Adam and Eve and the animals and all that got affected by their sins. The whole of their descendants, mankind, all became sinners and all are now subject to death and decay. So Jesus comes in as the second Adam. Instead of uh, doing do or die, he says, done, I've done it and I've, I've died for you. Okay, he completed the probationary period. By the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. And we, we put it in another pattern. This is all the world, all in Adam, all are sinners, all are dying. But the moment you accept Jesus Christ, you will be in Jesus Christ. And what happens? Much more have the grace of God, much more those who receive the abundance of grace. Grace abounded all the more. This more theme in Romans 5 is basically saying, what you had in Adam for starters was, uh, before the completion of the probation therapy, he did not complete the test. Jesus completed the test. And all the results and the awards and the rewards he gets from the test is yours as a he an heir of Jesus Christ being into his kingdom and into his rest. Okay? Remember this? Uh, this is the summary of what transpired in the salvation transaction. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, at this time there's, there's guilt and condemnation. It's imputed to the descendants, making mankind guilty before God. And man also suffers the consequences. But you go to the, you know, to the other side, you know. Um, the poverty of man is there. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so that spread to all men because of sin. So there is a depravity of our nature and there is death. But in Jesus Christ, through Adam, physical and spiritual death came to mankind. The descendant, the, the descendant is federally united to Adam. Okay? But in Jesus Christ, through his vicarious death, we are forgiven. And through his sinless life, we are accepted. You put it this way, it's a better rendition. There are three imputations. And you know what an imputation is reckoning, accounting for. You, you do not become actually what it is. It's only accounted, put in your account. So the first imputation was Adam's sin was imputed to mankind. That's why we all die and we're sinners. And then the second imputation is mankind's sin was imputed to Christ. When he came on the cross and Christ fulfilled the demands of the law. And then the third imputation is Christ's righteousness and sacrifice is imputed to the believers. So it's amazing where mankind's sin drag us into death and decay and sin and then this sin and death and decay was imputed to Jesus Christ when he came so that we who will believe can find righteousness. This is what Hebrews is saying. Stop. Everything has been accomplished in Jesus Christ. It has been finished. Enter his rest. You can now rest and celebrate in what Jesus has done. Okay, one thing we want to clarify, very important. The law is not legalism. Every time, you know, we are allergic to law now because we want, we are of grace. You hear this all the time. Because... Because any, any mention of the law is, is smacks of legalism. The law is not legalism. The law is an expression of who God is, and it is absurd to say, God, we have to forget what you are like in order to understand grace. We cannot appreciate grace until we know what God is like. The law is not legalism. It is the wrong use of the law that is legalism. What is legalism? Legalism is using the law or obeying the law in order to be saved. That's legalism. But there's another way to use the law instead of using it as a means of salvation. Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of, or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
The law points to Jesus as the way of salvation. There's no other way to be saved. Acts 4, 12 says, except for Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, we have this placard, so to speak, in legalism that says, we'll work for salvation. Therefore, no one will be justified in his sight by works of the law, for the law merely brings awareness of sin. You cannot be saved. You cannot be justified before God to the works of the law. That's why all that the law does is tell you that you're a sinner, that you need a Savior. That's what the law does. So you go to your Savior to be saved by Jesus Christ in the gospel. And once you are saved by Jesus Christ, Jesus points you back to the law as the way of discipleship. What does it say? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So this is a use of the law to love Jesus Christ or to walk as his disciple. You're not using the law in order to be saved. You're using the law as a response to the salvation that Christ has given to you. So if you use the law in order to express your love to Jesus Christ, that's the right use of the law, and that's not legalism. In fact, when Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. How, what is the command now? The way you obey the law is to become like me. You love people the way I love people. The question is, you want to grow in your Christian life? You want to mature? You don't do it by wringing your fingers and your hands in order for you to be good or holy. What you need to do is just look at Jesus and follow what Jesus did. And by following Jesus, you will obey the law and you can express your love to him. John says, Dear friends, I am not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one you have had from the very beginning. The old commandment to love one another is the same message you heard before. It's the same message. Yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment and you also are living it. And say, although it's old, the commandment to love has been there since the get-go. It is new in the sense that Jesus lived that truth and you also now live the truth because you want to express your love to Jesus Christ. So law is not legalism. Legalism is using the law in order to be saved. But when the law becomes an instrument whereby you can express your love for Jesus Christ as a true disciple, and what happens then you will see the value of God's law and God's will in your life. Again, a very powerful quote from Ellen White. I don't want to miss this. I want to share this with you. The price was paid to purchase the redemption of man. When in the last soul struggle, the blessed words were uttered, which seemed to resound through creation. It is finished. Upon this theme, it is sin to become an unimpassioned. Well, it's a very powerful word. It's saying, you always talk about the cross and how God, through Jesus Christ, Save us from our sins and went to suffering and death in order for us to be forgiven. Ellen White tells us that if, if you look at the cross and what's going on and doesn't do anything to you, it would be a sin because by looking at what God has done, you will be full of passion in your heart to be able to love Him back and serve Him. So we're done with the, the, the first two pitfalls, which is materialism and legalism. The last pitfall we want to avoid in order to enter God's rest is the the pitfall of activism. Hebrews 4, 6 says, Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Oh, the children of Israel weren't able to enter the rest because they were disobedient. We kind of cover that. Remember, Moses came and told the people, and all the people said, All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. In Deuteronomy 1, 30 and 30, it says, The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. Yet, in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God. This explains the 40 years sojourn in the wilderness. Because they sent the 12 spies. Only two spies said, let's go and enter the land because the Lord our God will be with us. We will be able to overcome. The rest said, no, they're giants. They're going to kill us. They're going to slaughter us. Why did you have to... Take us out of Egypt only to die in the hands of our enemies. So they did not believe because they did not believe they did not obey. Let's go, that goes back to what Dietrich Bonhoeffer says. Remember what God said. You know, they promised they will obey, but they didn't realize that they cannot obey. So the way the Ten Commandments begins is not by saying, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The preamble is always missed. It says, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. 
In other words, before you can even follow the commandments, you got to understand I, that I am God who redeemed you from slavery in Egypt. If you know my redemption, then you'll be able to follow and obey me. That's why immediately after the promise at Sinai and of the giving of the law, God had to introduce the sanctuary system. And what does he say? And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. And through the sanctuary system, we know that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The whole idea is not the ability to obey and follow God because you cannot. In our nature, we're sinful, we're selfish, we're greedy. And God said, the only way you can do it is if I find a provision for you to be forgiven and it's through the blood that you will find pardon. Remember the story, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Amazing. That the timing of the crucifixion and the Passover, because Jesus is our Passover lamb. Throughout the history of the Israelite nation, God was saying, you cannot be saved by trying to be good, because you are not good. You are sinners. The only way you can be saved is if I cleanse you through my blood and redeem you through the blood to the sacrifice that I'm willing to do in order for you to be saved. So let's, let's go into what this means, this activism thing, in an illustration in the Bible. Okay, There's a story in Luke 10 about Jesus traveling, entering the village of Bethany. Uh, and of course, the, the eldest sister, which is Martha, you got Mary and Lazarus, were there in order to entertain the guests. And this was the hangout of Jesus Christ when he ministered in Capernaum and the neighboring villages and towns, he went to the house of Martha, Lazarus, and Mary. Martha, who entertained Jesus, had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. You can see Mary, every time Jesus comes, sits at the Lord's feet. Even if women were not allowed to sit at the rabbi's feet because she got to be male, uh, Mary did that to listen to Jesus Christ. But Martha was distracted with much serving. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things. So what, what was Jesus trying to say? Because Martha now is so frantic, she wants to cook for at least 13 men who are so hungry. And, and, and cooking during that time, Martha, they didn't have refrigerators. They don't have all the amenities of an oven and a stove. You know, cooking took time. And to feed 13 men was no small matter so she she kept busy in the kitchen and while mary sits down at the feet of jesus christ also one writer was saying she was busy with the work of the lord but not with the lord of the work so what happened in the story she went up to him and said lord do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone then tell her to help me well the, the audacity of martha to command jesus christ to blame Mary, who was supposedly a, a lazy, was lazy, do, doing nothing. And Jesus looks at Martha and said, there is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and, will not be, and it will not be taken away from her. Oh, Jesus is saying, Martha, Martha, you know, I know your heart. You want to feed us, you want to be nice. But you know, there's only one thing important, more important than food. After all, you know, uh, have you been to a house where it's very difficult to move? You know, because you might break the china, you, you might dirty the floor. Yeah, that, that's not the kind of house you want to go into. You want to go into a house where you can crash and you're really buddy buddies with owners. You can lift up your feet, you know, and then you can talk casually. That was the kind of relationship he had with Jesus. And it was, he was so perturbed, she was so perturbed that they might not be able to eat. So if it's time to be very formal, then Jesus is saying, come on. Martha, there's only one thing that's necessary. It's my relationship with you that really counts. That's why Jesus was the one who said, People honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. During the time of Jesus, there was worship. There were obedience to the law. There was activism that was going on, primarily instigated by the Pharisees. But you know what Jesus said? You worship me externally, but your heart is so far away from me. Matthew 23, we kind of studied this before. What, do the Pharisees, what did the Pharisees do? They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. You know, what happened was uh, in, in the Jewish system, 
uh, they look at the Ten Commandments um, and, and they fit all the other requirements around the Ten Commandments. And after they did that, all the Jewish rabbis and the Pharisees came up with 613 commandments. And this, out of the 613 commandments, 234 has something to do with the Sabbath. It's almost half of the commandments that the Jews put together in all their commentaries and the way they understood the Torah or the Old Testament had something to do with the Sabbath. That's why there were so many strict and very heavy burdens in terms of the Sabbath commandment. And instead of being rest, the Sabbath becomes a very big and heavy burden. Is, is, it, is it possible for this to be happening today? We kind of discussed that. And, you know, it, the warning here is it, it's even possible to be very busy with God, God's work, and not enter His rest. This is what the warning is with fear and trembling. Make sure you don't miss or fail to enter the rest. This is one of the most terrifying and scary passages in scriptures. In Matthew 7, 22, 23, Jesus says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You know, I like the way the New Living Translation, Eugene uh, Peterson translation, paraphrases this. It says, I can see it now at the final judgment, thousands strutting up to me and saying, Master, we preach the message. We bash the demons. Our super spiritual projects had everyone talking. And do you know what I am going to say? This is what Jesus will say. You missed the boat. All you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. <laughs> Very contemporary. But Jesus is what Jesus is trying to say, you can be engaged in activism. You are so active in doing the Lord's work, but don't even know who the Lord is. This is what the Pharisees did. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor, a feast and the best seats in the synagogues. Why were the Pharisees obeying the law and were being active? Oh, because they wanted to be recognized. I love the way Pastor defined legalism last week in the sermon in our church. Legalism is obeying the law for the sake of ourselves. And you can be active trying to do everything that you can to serve God in church and all religious activities. And you know what? While you're doing it, if you're only doing, seeking to do it for yourself, you will never find rest. Remember the story? of the prodigal son and the elder brother when the prodigal son came back that was covered again in the sermon of our pastor last week <laughs> he said look this many years i observed you and i never disobeyed your command yet you never gave me a younger goat that i might celebrate with my friends you know although luke 15 has something to do about lostness if you read the context luke 15 was a, a series of parables given by jesus to address the pharisees because they were questioning why Jesus was associating with sinners and publicans. And this is what Jesus says, that the, the climax of his message to the Pharisees. This prodigal elder who were the Pharisees said, I already obeyed you. I never disobeyed you. You know, I was so active. I did everything that you want. But you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. All he did for his father was to get a goat. You will never enter in the dress if you serve God to just get that goat, to get something from God. You will never enter the rest. So epitomized by Phil Vischer, you remember we talked about him, he, he originated VeggieTales. I realize I'm not supposed to be pursuing impact, I'm supposed to be pursuing God. And when I pursue God, I will have exactly as much impact as he wants me to have. The Lord frustrates our plans, shatters our purposes, lets us see the wreck of all our hopes, and whispers to us, it's not your work I wanted, but you. How do you enter in the rest? 
not through activism so that you can get brownie points or recognition and honor for what you do, with which we become very guilty so many times. It may be not about us, but we end up saying, hey, maybe we should do this so that Seventh-day Adventists will be recognized. So we do it for the sake of our denomination, not for the sake of God. You will never find rest. So the passage ends with an exhortation for us, which we covered last week, that is therefore strive to enter the rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. What does it say? Hey, with fear and trembling, make sure that you not fail to enter the dress. So let's strive. An oxymoron of striving and resting. We talked about this last week. What is that work of striving? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in Him who has sent. The work is to believe in God or to trust God. Once you trust God, you'll be able to enter the dress. But you got to strive to do this. Well, why, why is it a striving? Philippians 2, 12, 13, it says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There you go. That's, those are the words. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. What is Paul saying here? You got to work out with fear and trembling. You got to strive to enter the rest and the trust in Jesus Christ. Because it is God who works in you. You cannot do it yourself. God has got to work in you. Which takes us back to the slide we shared last week. Surrender is not a battle of the will. It is an act of worship. How do you surrender? How do you strive to depend on God? It is by offering your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is true worship. You got to worship Him. You must find delight and passion in God for this to happen. Otherwise, you will not obey Him out of joy and delight. What did David say? One thing have I asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. If there's one thing in my life that I desire, says David, it is to be in the presence of God all my life. Because by being in the presence of God, you then find the rest and you'll be able to enter the rest of God and the rest of Jesus Christ. And he, he says in Hebrews 12, verse 1, Looking unto Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Therefore, while the promise of entering the rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. That's a warning. Started their study about those warning sections. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That's the promise of the Lord. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. That's why the prayer of David in Psalms 51 should be our prayer. We don't have a heart for God. So what's the solution? We must pray that God gives us a heart for him. What does David say? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Doug Hammers Joel said, very beautiful quote, Give me a pure heart that I may see thee, a humble heart that I may hear thee, a heart of love that I may serve thee, and a heart of faith that I may abide in thee. We start our day with this prayer and ask God to give us a heart for Him, we will understand what it means to enter His rest. Because as we said, the main proposition of the entire quarter, if you were to ask me, this is the key text for all the lessons in our quarterly. How do we enter the rest? The promise is, and He said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. How do you enter His rest? You enter His rest by going into His presence every day. By being in God's presence every day and finding contentment and delight in Him, you will avoid the pitfall of materialism, of legalism, and hypocritical activism. Instead, you will know that all that matters is God, His presence in your life. And then, and only then, can you say, I have entered His rest and I'm secure. 
Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this study. Hebrews 4 is very loaded. Sometimes very difficult to understand, but if we read it in terms of the promised rest in the Lord Jesus Christ and how we can enter it through your own initiative and what you have done in Jesus Christ, we know all that we need to do is flee to you and ask you to give us a heart for you. Once we have that heart that you've given, we will now long for your presence. And as we dwell in your presence, you will give us what you have promised. You will give us rest. In Jesus' name I pray.